seismic analysis overview. So the basic process of uh, conducting seismic analysis is pretty much the same across all codes. This particular process uh, that I have listed here is taken for uh, specifically for the Eurocode EC8, but it, uh, it, it maintains its uh, close similarity with the uh, Ashwell RFT and also with many other codes. So first of all is our basic requirement. So what uh, we want is uh, a no collapse and a minimization of damage. We then go for uh, compliance criteria, that is we go for resistance verification, uh, capacity, ductility verifications and an effective stiffness uh, in case of seismic actions. We then decide on a method of seismic action, so whether we want to do the response spectrum analysis, whether we want to go for pushover and uh, time history representation. So one of these, uh, we go for uh, these options. We also check uh, the seismic action decision is also made based on the regularity of the bridges. Then finally, we go for uh, the method of uh, analysis, which uh, further further in. So for example, if, um, if we are choosing the static seismic method or uh, response spectrum method, we go into further details of that. And at the end, we do a final verification. That is whether the, uh, in case of uh, the pushover analysis, for example, whether the demand is uh, less than the capacity, or in case of uh, other analysis, whether the various results are within the permissible parameters. So coming first to our basic requirements. So the basic requirements are pretty much the same across uh, both the American as well as the European code. We have uh, a non-collapse requirement, that is the structure should not collapse. Under ULS, it should maintain its structural integrity and uh, even though at some parts of the bridge considerable damage may occur, but overall the bridge should not collapse. And it should also be able to sustain traf actions from emergency traffic inspection and repair should be easy. The SLS requirements are usually along the lines of damage minimization. That is only non-load bearing or secondary components of the bridge should, should sustain any damage if any damage is indeed required to be sustained. So the compliance criteria is basically divided into three major categories. You can see here resistance verifications, ductility verifications, and displacement control. So resistance verification is basically the regions where plastic hinges are being formed should have adequate flexural strength to resist the design seismic uh, action effects. Ductility verifications, as the name suggests, the structure should have enough uh, global ductility to resist, to uh, adequately resist uh, the seismic forces without, under, without uh, having too much uh, deflect, deformation, too much cracking. Uh, the control of displacements. Now, uh, even if a structure, even if a structure may be ductile, but uh, too much displacement is also not a good thing. So, a global. Uh, so, there are two basic levels of displacement control. That is, global displacement control, and member level displacement control. As you can see in this slide. So, global displacement, as I suggest, is uh, globally the entire structure should not deform beyond a set limit, while at the member level it is usually restricted to rotational constraints. Let's talk a little bit about some earthquake resisting systems. So over the past uh, few decades, seismic uh, analysis has been given a very, very, uh, in, very intensive, uh, uh, very intensive observation and a lot of theories have now been developed. So over these years, all the collective knowledge now suggests that uh, in case of bridges, the hinge formation is most ideally suited at uh, the base, at uh, the top and bottom levels of uh, the pier of the pier support. So plastic hinges at uh, inspectable locations, particularly of elast or elastic design of columns, and abutment resistance is uh, not usually required if it is not an integral abutment. Similarly, for transverse cases, uh, plastic it has pretty much the same. Uh, criteria as for the longitudinal ones. Just that in case of multiple supported spans, uh, they should have adequate support lengths and plastic hinges again should be in inspectable locations. But 
what is not recommended for uh, the case of bridges or more specifically for new bridges that are formed is that plastic hinge should not form within the superstructure the in case of uh, girder bridges plus cap beam plastic hinging is not is not uh, recommended particularly when it uh, causes the girder to sag because this directly affects the deck furthermore bearing systems that uh, do not provide expected for expected or uh, unexpected displacements as well for example rocker bearings which are relatively stiff in the transverse direction so these are not recommended and battered pile systems that are not designed to fuse geotechnically or structurally by elements with the adequate ductility capacity so what this means is battered systems that don't have enough ductility should not be used in new bridges now in case of old bridges which uh, were let's say con constructed about uh, maybe 10 or 5 or 10 years ago they may not uh, have complied with this criteria so in these bridges uh, only retrofitting and uh, maintenance checks can be performed so let's come over to the types of seismic analysis that are available so seismic analysis is broadly categorized into two types linear and nonlinear each of them is further subdiv subdivided into uh, static and dynamic so on this slide you can quite easily see uh, how what are the various types of uh, seismic analysis that are available to us so today in uh, this session we shall be covering we shall be going into response spectrum and pushover analysis in a bit of detail and towards the end I will also be showing you the uh, time history analysis uh, a few aspects of time history analysis as well talking about regularity of bridges now this is something that is uh, that has come uh, you can expect that the regularity of uh, bridges <laughs> sorry about that uh, so you can expect that the regularity of bridges is related to its uh, the geometry of the bridge so in case of irregular now in case of regular bridges it uh, the engineer will find it very easy to anticipate what the seismic response is going to be but uh, in case of irregular bridges what may happen is that the response of the bridge uh, the elastic response and the inelastic response of the bridge may be very very different so in case of irregular bridges sorry nonlinear analysis of uh, nonlinear analysis is more recommended so nonlinear analysis cases include uh, the pushover analysis or nonlinear uh, time history analysis so EC8 uh, recommends that you calculate regularity by calculating an R value which is uh, calculated from this equation on the slide and if R exceeds the value 2 the bridge is classified as an irregular shape now Arstol RFD prescribes a bit more uh, straightforward and more easier to follow rules you, there is not much calculation involved the param you simply calculate it based on the parameters that are entered over here so here you have uh, if the number of spans for two so the maximum span length is span length ratio is there and uh, if any of the bridge parameters is exceeding any of the prescribed parameters over here the bridge is considered irregular furthermore uh, the Arstal RFD code also makes allowances for uh, the method to be used when con for irregular and regular bridges so here you have for example UL is uniform load elastic method SM is single mode elastic method MM is uh, the multi mode elastic method or uh, the eigenvalue method and TH is time history method so as a rule of thumb it can be generally assumed that uh, for irregular bridges pushover analysis is always recommended even in conjunction with uh, normal elastic methods right so before going into response spectrum analysis I'd like to just uh, talk a little bit more about uh, two very prevalent methodologies of uh, design when it comes to seismic analysis the first is force based design wherein we assume that the elastic response and the inelastic response is similar under for a structure when we are cons uh, and uh, this and this similarity this assumes similarity 
allows us to calculate the earthquake loading FP in the slide by considering a response modification factor R. One of the basic assumptions of uh, this particular method of design is that we are simply calculating the force. We are assuming that the capacity is assumed. What I mean by capacity is assumed is that we are assuming that the that these deflections or that the response is not exceeding the capacity of the structure. So this is one of the basic assumptions in in force based design. Displacement based design however also takes into consideration the capacity of the structure. So it still makes the same assumption that uh, the in that the displacement resulted from inelastic response is uh, approximately the same as that from the uh, elastic linear elastic uh, response however the design once the design load is is found what is finally to be checked is that the capacity response is that the capacity is larger than the demand response so the, that capacity may be either the deflection it may be the force so any one, any one of these things can be termed as the capacity and the corresponding parameter also becomes uh, on the demand side so now that uh, we've come, we've discussed a little bit about the various methods, let's talk about the first method, that is the response spectrum method. <clears throat> so the response spectrum method is, I'm sorry, the response spectrum method is uh, one of the most commonly used methods in uh, for seismic analysis. So <clears throat> The response spectrum curve uh, is found basically expressed in terms of uh, reference seismic action with the ref return reference period of 475 years uh, as per the Euro code and uh, it can be different uh, for other codes or it can be same as this code. Uh, and of course the response spectrum is de dependent on a lot of things. For example, it depends on the amount of damping, it depends on the class of the structure, it depends on the ground type. So here in on the right hand side of this slide you see the ground type classification A, B, C, D, E then S1 and S2. So this classification is pretty much the same across nearly all the codes. So even in Ashto code you will find A, B, C, D, E type uh, ground classifications and even the uh, descriptions are almost exactly the same. The only difference between them will be in the uh, parameters for example the uh, SPT parameters, SPT limits may be different, uh, the velocity uh, of the seismic velocity may be different across uh, the various limits, but overall it is pretty much the same. So here uh, one additional thing in Arstol RFD that is uh, different from the Eurocode is that Arstol RFD makes mention of seismic design category that is SDC. So Ashto LRFD has the provision of uh, that the engineer can create his or her own response spectrum based on uh, the SDC based on the SDC category and the SDC value which can be calculated from SD1 so based on these limits so SDCA is the area of least seismicity and SDCD is the area of maximum seismicity <coughs> so maximum seismic hazard so it is in the order of increasing seismic hazard levels. Coming on to cracked section properties. Now, uh, when you're doing seismic analysis, it is a given that uh, the parameter, that the bridge parameters, uh, that the bridge sections are assumed to be cracked. And uh, for linear elastic analysis, the bridge sections are assumed to be non-cracked for, uh, for the various uh, loadings. So in terms of uh, the pre what the EC8 suggests, so Eurocode 8 suggests the uh, effective moment of inertia as uh, about point a as about 8% uh, of the uncracked added to the effective uh, cracked moment of inertia which is calculated based on M5 analysis, based on the moment curvature analysis. So I'll be showing you this M5 analysis in uh, GST when we come to pushover analysis. But for, for, the mat, for, for the moment, uh, you can uh, rest assured that 
our softwares are capable of calculating the uh, M5 curvature and the crack moment of inertia for you. The same provisions under the ASTO LRFD actually go uh, for a slightly less conservative uh, values. So there it was uh, the exact same thing. So it is almost exactly the same formula, but the Eurocode adds 8% of the uncracked section uh, stiffness to it. An additional provision in ASTO LRFD specifically for RC box cutters is that uh, for RC box cutters you can assume that uh, the values are anywhere between 50% to 75% of the uncracked stiffness but for pre-stress box girders uh, it is recommended that no reduction be applied. So at this point let me show you uh, some of the capabilities of our software. So this is our this is our software Midas Civil. So for those of you who have already used Midas Civil, you may be knowing a lot about it. But for those of you who do not, uh, this is the general interface of our software, and uh, this is the basic model I will be working on. Let me explain a little bit about this model. It is a very simple steel eye girder composite bridge. Simply support. Uh, it is a continuous uh, two-span bridge. So let me show it to you in. Uh, the solid view. So here you can see in solid modeling. So it has a deck, uh, a concrete deck placed over it and uh, steel girders beneath. So when you want to apply a seismic analysis, a response spectrum analysis to this sort of a bridge, you can very easily go for it uh, in that in Midas Civil we have the option of uh, adding response spectrum functions. So when you click, uh, so here let me show you what are the various response spectrum functions that Midas Civil supports. So here you can see we have a list of all the response spectrums that are supported. So RSTOL RFD, Eurocode 8, UBC, NBC, IBC, uh, the Korean, Chinese, Taiwanese, Indian and Japanese response spectrums are completely supported within Midas Civil itself. Furthermore, if there is something that you find is uh, not supported or if you want to add your own response spectrum, you can simply copy paste the response spectrum values into this uh, particular table over here which is completely Excel compatible. So your own self, uh, your own values can also be added. So we can also consider the excitation angle for uh, the major axis of the structure. Various stamping methods can also be considered, uh, which I will be showing you shortly. So we have, uh, when we consider damping, so for the most part, most of the codes talk about uh, one of the two, SRSS and CQC. So both the Ashtal RFD and the Euro code talk about uh, these two uh, conditions SRSS and CQC. So SRSS is more useful when the mode shapes are uh, well separated. So, but in case they are not well separated, uh, the CQC co uh, combination is uh, more uh, appropriate. And in fact, the CQC combination is usually recommended at uh, for nearly all bridges. And you can also add uh, signage to the results. So if you want to consider the signs when, co when combining these uh, mode shapes, so you can, uh, add, you can use this option over here to add signs and you can select which mode shapes you want to consider for uh, the modal combination. So if there are some mode shapes that you feel are not important and you want to exclude them from the analysis, so that can also be done. And uh, the damping itself, so Midas provides uh, three basic kinds of damping. So we have modal, which is uh, global modal damping can be considered, or you can specify different damping ratios for different modes. Mass and stiffness proportional, where uh, you can specify the damping coefficients based on uh, this formula. So you have to enter the values of uh, A0 and A1. 
and strain energy proportional wherein uh, you can specify common damping for certain groups of elements so within the same mode you can have different damping ratios for different elements and finally uh, since response spectrum analysis in our software in fact in all major FEM softwares is conducted using uh, eigenvalue analysis so we support uh, the three major eigenvalue, eigenvalue analysis types that are uh, RITS vectors uh, we have the support for RITS vectors which are useful uh, when you don't when your uh, mass participation is uh, approaching a coming at a very high number of uh, modes we have subspace iteration and we have lag source so let me go back to the software so here in this case uh, I can show you in the works tree I have defined my function over here for example Ashto, uh, I have used the Ashto LRFD co, uh, design spectrum and I have defined a particular load case so here this is the RSY load case where I have put the excitation angle as 90 degrees so that is the global y direction I've chosen the LRFT code from here and I can choose my modal combination control as well so from here I can uh, I've chosen uh, nearly everything and you can choose to apply what kind of damping you would like so by default if this is unchecked the damping is selected directly from the response spectrum uh, that has been chosen so if you choose to apply a mode a damping ratio you can choose uh, any of the three that I explained in the presentation and if in case when you choose uh, the damping method so for different damping you would have different response spectra so in that case the software would need to interpolate between the response spectra to accurately uh, know which response spectrum is to be used which response spectrum value is to be used so there you can choose whether you want to interpolate linearly or whether you want to interpolate logarithmically finally the eigenvalue analysis control that uh, I can show you here has uh, eigenvectors and rich sectors both so once this is done this is an all this is already analyzed so I can show you let me first show you the uh, mode shapes of the structure so we go into wireframe mode and here I can show you in the legend so you can choose uh, to view the mode shapes over here and it directly shows you the mass participation so here you have MPM percentage so in the X direction we have 97 percent mass participation in mode 1 itself if you want you can also get a tabular view of it so here you get uh, the table the tables for uh, the frequency and uh, the mass participation tables as well so here you can see uh, that coming close to uh, let's say about uh, mode 27 so here in mode 27 you can see we have 90% uh, mass participation across all three degrees of freedom now the 90% mass participation uh, requirement is common across both the Euro code as well as the uh, Ashto LRFT code and in fact it is pretty much common across all major codes so furthermore we also have the option of uh, getting the nodal results of response spectrum so if I want the response spectrum values so I can get uh, the inertial force values here I can uh, directly get get these values or I can if I want I can also even find the values of acceleration so in uh, the selected units for example here it is uh, feet per second square so I'm using the unit of kip feet or I can get the tabular results for this as well so let's say for uh, three modes so here as I go down you can see the nodal inertia force in case as well as the nodal acceleration and finally if you want to just get, just get the base shear and uh, the basic data you can just go into uh, forces beam diagrams and uh, from here I can choose any of the response spectrum load cases let me choose FZ so from here 
sorry fy in this case so from here I can directly get the base shear since this is RSY I have to choose FY so I can easily get the base shear at the column levels and furthermore since most codes also specify a 130 rule what do I mean by 130 rule uh, what I mean is 100% uh, when we choose let's say in X direction so in RX it should be 100% of uh, the RX plus 30% of the RY so this is the 130 rule so 100% uh, so of uh, the response in one direction plus 30% of the response in the orthogonal direction so we can create load combinations for this and we can get the uh, desired responses for these combinations also All right, so that was uh, just a little bit about the response spectrum analysis and uh, as I explained already uh, the 130 rule that uh, is there uh, commonly across uh, both codes and one other thing that uh, one final thing that I would like to mention is the presence of the foundation now the American code describes this very clearly that uh, in case of uh, a fixed footing you would have uh, the bridge deflecting in a certain manner but in case of when the foundation has flexibility as would be in the case of a real structure the deflection is slightly greater than when you assume a fixed footing so in such a case in such a scenario let me open up a file for you wherein I have considered a foundation so here I have uh, modeled a, fa a foundation so here I have modeled a pile foundation uh, for this particular model and for the soil structure interaction I have assumed a point I have assumed point spring supports over here now Midas Civil is also very good in that there is an option here let me show it to you for integral bridges here you can you have the option of directly defining pile springs so th when you select a set of piles this will automatically select you will just have to enter some parameters like the pile diameter the ground level uh, the coefficient of subgrade modulus, uh, the initial soil module, and uh, just select the soil type. So once you enter these data, the late, these point spring supports for the soil will automatically be active, be applied, and uh, the user himself doesn't have to do too much effort. Okay, so in this case, the deformations I can uh, assure you. So here let me say for RSX, the deformations will come to the tune of about uh, one of about uh, 1.4 yeah 0.14 meters. Whereas uh, in the case of the fixed footing, we had deformations of the order of uh, 0.09 uh, sorry 0.9 meters. So obviously we can see that uh, in the case of uh, flexible foundations, the response is. Uh, slightly greater than that in case of a fixed foundation so for this purpose uh, the foundation should also be considered while uh, creating the model so let's come now to pushover analysis so response spectrum method is basically a method for finding the demand of our structure now if we are conducting displacement based design as we normally do nowadays or particularly in case of an irregular structure we need to consider the capacity of the structure as well so pushover analysis basically compares the demand to the capacity of the structure and helps us find what is known as a performance point that is the intersection of the demand and capacity curves so demand is a representation of the earthquake ground motion and uh, it is represented by an estimation of deformation that the structure is expected to go Capacity is a representation of the structure's ability to resist the this seismic demand, and performance is basically uh, the 
whether the capacity is able to handle the demand or not. So one very basic thing is that the demand and capacity curves are made based on different parameters. The pushover curve is a curve bet uh, between force and displacement, whereas the spectral acceleration graph, the response spectrum curve, is spectral acceleration versus time. So in order to accurately compare them, these curves are transformed into capacity spectrum and demand spectrum by using certain methods that uh, you can see in this slide. So they are both transformed into acceleration displacement spectrum and once that acceleration displacement spectrum has been created they can be further transformed into any other uh, spectrum that is needed like a force displacement, uh, base, she base shear displacement or so on. Finally, once these spectrums have been created, they are uh, overlapped on each other and are compared to get the final performance point. So one reason now we should, uh, one question we should ask ourselves, why do we want to go for pushover analysis? Because uh, of course it is not uh, an easy to perform analysis, it, is, uh, it requires a bit of understanding, it, is, it requires a lot of time as well. So why do we want to do it? Well, the estimation of the sequence of uh, it allows us to basically gauge the plasticity of the structure to in a bit to a more accurate degree. Furthermore, in case of irregular bridges where the nonlinear response is markedly different from the linear response, it is a very recommended procedure and should be undertaken regardless of whether or not uh, you wish to do it. And finally, it adds a certain level of uh, confidence to uh, our uh, basic model. So pushover load cases can now be made basically when we do pushover, we normally apply uh, like a, either a force or horizontal force in increments or we apply a horizontal displacement in the form of increments again. So this slide basically shows uh, the load increment that has been defined as per EC8. So load distribution method, you can have constant along the deck. And uh, this is pretty much similar to the uniform load, uniform load distribution method as uh, described by the ASTO code as well. When it comes to Midas Civil, uh, our program supports uh, pushover curves from FEMA 273 Euro code 8, uh, multilinear, uh, multilinear pushover, multilinear hinge types, uh, masonry model and user defined hinge types are also available. <clears throat> then displacement and force control, force based control methods are available. We have a facility for uh, applying the pushover analysis to truss, beam, wall and even springs. We can find both performance point, performance point and uh, target displacement and uh, we can perform checks for acceptable performance like uh, drift limitations and deformations or uh, strength capacity. So I've uh, already explained uh, up a little bit about our uh, hinge types. So we have FEMA, bilinear, trilinear type and uh, Eurocode 8 as well. Furthermore, uh, actual force uh, moment interaction and aside from this, we can also create the M5 interaction curve from Midas GSD. So for example, if you have uh, a very irregular kind of structure and you wish to, uh, like if you are pretty sure that uh, any, that the uh, predefined, uh, predefined types will not suffice for this. So you can use our program Midas GSD. Let me open up a model for pushover analysis and let me show you how you can use Midas GST to create an M5 curve and uh, how you can import it into Midas. So let me open the general section designer here. Now the general section designer is a tool for uh, conducting nonlinear analysis on uh, sections. And uh, let me just import a particular file. So here you can see 
the uh, circular column that uh, has been used. Now we can directly import this circular column into GSD from Midas Civil itself and uh, once it is imported we can specify what kind of nonlinear material property we want it to have. So the basic nonlinear properties that you can apply to it are uh, the curvilinear model, bilinear, Kenton Park, Mander model, uh, trilinear concrete as well. So in this case I have used the Mander model and uh, now when I run the analysis so it creates for me the PM interaction curve, the moment curvature diagram and the stress contours as well. So this is the PM interaction curve that you can see over here. Let me come over to the uh, stress contours. So here you can see under the given loading what kind of uh, contours are being created. And finally the moment curvature diagram. So this is the moment curvature diagram as per the uh, Mander model. So in order to create the uh, idealized curve, in order to get the crack moment and the M5 properties we have to display, create the idealized model. So I apply it. So here you can see an idealized uh, M5 curve has been created and simultaneously we have this heading under here called cracked moment of inertia I crack which is uh, 0 0.0296 uh, f under uh, definition of meters. Now once this has been done we can export this quite easily into Midas uh, Civil. So here you have to specify the hinge length. Now what is the hinge length? Let me uh, go back to the slide. So the hinge length is, uh, so is a parameter that is defined across both uh, EC8 and uh, RSOLIFD. So the hinge length is defined basically because uh, if the hinge length is uh, not specified it may be that uh, across an element you, you may only have uh, plastic hinge at the ING end but not in the middle. So the hinge length uh, definition is also important and uh, so here we have uh, the LP hinge length definition based on EC8 and quite curiously the hinge length definition in ASTO and RFD is very very similar to that of uh, EC8. In ASTO in EC8 this parameter was just 0.1 whereas in uh, ASTO this parameter is 0.8. So the ASTO and RFD has a slightly lesser hinge length as compared to Eurocode but uh, the overall uh, logic and the overall terminology used is also quite similar. Coming back to GSD, so once this has been done you can just click OK, you just need to name the, uh, give a name to the M5 curve and once you've gone back, so once it has been imported, let me show you how it is imported into uh, Midas Civil. So this is the pushover hinge uh, definition box and here let me show you the yield properties. So this is the way that you can see it. So these are the yield properties of uh, the pushover hinge and you can even get into more details over here. So here this is the, uh, this is very similar to the FEMA type that it has defined. So even here you can uh, feel free if the engineer wishes it he or she can uh, make certain changes to the values if they feel that it is uh, too over conservative or uh, not conservative enough. For the moment uh, I have used uh, FEMA curves and let me show you the various uh, controls for uh, pushover analysis. In Midas Civil Pusher analysis can be performed not only for uh, normal uh, peer sections but also while you have considered the foundation. So we have this support di di dialog box for uh, point spring supports where you have uh, nonlinear support type. So even nonlinear springs can be added. So the multilinear spring type that is created during uh, the soil structure interaction uh, boundary con conditions. So those can also be included. You can choose your uh, uh, slip type as bilinear or trilinear. 
and you can choose where you want to stop the analysis. So if you want to stop the analysis at uh, shear component or uh, actual component yield, you can stop it there. Then we have the pushover load cases. So let me show you the pushover load cases. So here we have, uh, you can choose the increment method as a load control or as a displacement control. So here I've chosen displacement control with node 34. So node 34 is uh, the node at the pier cap beam. So here I, it is being highlighted now. So I hope you can see it. And furthermore, the load pattern can be created in the following, following ways. You can have uh, static load cases. So the load will be taken from the static load case directly. You can have it in the form of uniform acceleration as well. So the load is converted to acceleration type and is applied uh, incrementally. And you can have mode shape. Now, this is a rather uh, new addition to the theory of pushover analysis. This is because when earlier we used to do pushover analysis, it was basically we were just pushing it along. Uh, we were just incrementally pushing the structure along one direction. That was basically that basically meant we were restricting ourselves to one mode and one mode only. Now, if this, uh, in the case of an earthquake, the structure vibrates in a, a lot of different modes. And therefore, it may be that the critical plasticity may not be in the first mode, but rather maybe in maybe the second mode, the third mode, or in any of the other modes. So if you want, you can choose the mode, choose it as mode shape, and you can select which mode uh, you want to perform the analysis for and you can see the plasticity behavior for that mode okay so once this has been done we can perform the analysis I've already explained to you the hinge types and uh, the hinge has been defined as well so let me show you the hinge status <laughs> So this is, I'm showing you the rotational ductility factor and uh, let me show you the legend of, uh, of it which gives uh, more details. So towards the end, as we can see the ductility factor exceeds 1 and uh, here we can see the lowermost nodes or the lowermost uh, points are now critical and have failed. Similarly, we can see the status of yielding. So towards the end. So here we can see uh, it is going into uh, completely, it is going into the plastic range. Similarly for, uh, let's say for mode Y. So you can see the plasticity behavior for uh, the different uh, hinges quite easily. Similarly, we have uh, plastic deformation as well. So you can check the what is the plastic deformation at the end of it all. And uh, the actual deformation, what is going to be the actual deformation. Furthermore, you can even get the forces and stresses. So if you want, like, uh, what is the force being experienced at a particular step. So you can get that as well. Now, finally, we come to the pushover curve the crux of our uh, discussion. So now this is the capacity curve that we have uh, for, our, for ourselves. I'm sorry. So we have our uh, capacity curve and for the demand curve let me choose, let's say, a demand spectrum, let's say C. So I can choose it from here and automatically it tell it, uh, we can see where the spectrum is, where the demand is going to be. So we get demand spectrum for different damping ratios. So we have at 5, 10, 15, and 20. So this is the lowermost one is for 20, 15, 10, and 5. So at the intersection points, we can clearly see where uh, it is, uh, where the performance points, performance points are. So for this particular uh, instance, for this particular model, the performance point is in the elastic range that is over here. And here we can see the details of the performance point.
Okay, so that was uh, a little bit about uh, pushover analysis as we can see uh, a little bit of repetition here in the slides now. So I've already explained the pushover hinge and uh, how you can how you can uh, import hinge, hinge properties from Midas, uh, J Midas GSD or you can choose between the various pre-available uh, hinge types like FEMA, Eurocode 8 uh, from the available options. And here you have the capacity curve again that I have already shown you. And one final thing is the local deformation verification. So local deformation verification uh, is basically a rotation check. So here let me show you called rotation check. So you can check whether the rotation, so here let me go to RY. So you can easily check whether the rotational demand is within the rotation is uh, within the capacity limits or not. So here you get a very very useful Excel compatible uh, report. So this report, in fact, all tables in Midas are Excel compatible. You can simply copy in Midas and paste in Excel. So here you get the plastic rotation, and here you get the plastic capacity. Finally, let's come over to time history analysis. Now, time history analysis, uh, of course, is uh, a very complex and a very wide field of study. Normally, when we talk of time history analysis, we generally refer to two kinds of uh, time history analyses that are uh, boundary nonlinear, wherein the structure is elastic, but the support conditions or rather the bearings usually are modeled as uh, nonlinear elements. This kind of uh, system is actually, this kind of system is preferred when it comes to time history analysis simply because it is much easier and uh, has uh, much quicker uh, much faster analysis time. The other kind is inelastic time history analysis, where um, mati where the material nonlinearity of the structure is uh, cons is considered. Now, in this case, uh, because uh, if we consider the entire material entire structure as nonlinear and then do a dynamic analysis with it, uh, it may take a very very long time. So, to consider efficiency, what is done normally by FEM programs and even by Midas Civil is that you consider only some critical parts as uh, non-linear and uh, the rest of the parts are considered linear. So it is basically a partial non-linear time history analysis in that, in that uh, sense. So this slide uh, gives a very brief and very basic overview of uh, time history analysis. So here you have uh, like what the for the linear case you have uh, the basic equation of dynamics, which is uh, slightly different for the nonlinear case wherein two additional factors come up. That is the factor for viscous damping and a factor for variable stiffness. So in Midas Civil, you have the option of automatically allowing and applying for uh, LRB isolators. So this is particularly useful for the boundary nonlinear dynamic analysis. So lead rubber bearing isolators uh, or friction pendulum isolators are available. We also have uh, spring and dashpot systems uh, available within uh, Midas Civil. So here in this slide, you can see uh, all the available systems like viscoelastic damper, uh, hook, gap, hysteretic systems, friction pendulum isolator systems are also available. So the damper systems, as I mentioned, are uh, viscoelastic damping systems and uh, hysteretic damping systems that are available for uh, automatic modeling. So you just need to enter the properties, the pertinent properties, and uh, they can be easily uh, ready for analysis. Then uh, when you want to model the nonlinearity or the material nonlinearity of the structure, so as I said, we do not consider the entire structure nonlinear, just the critical parts, usually the substructure parts like piers and in some instances the abutments. So in this case, uh, we assume we ap approximate that nonlinearity by applying nonlinear hinges which the, with the inelastic hinge models uh, for the, for the nonlinear dynamic analysis. 
So in this case, uh, Midas Civil supports the following uh, hinge models. We have uh, kinematic hardening, we have Takeda slip uh, model and multilinear model. So you can get, uh, quite easily you can get results like the status of yielding, the ductility factor and hysteresis curves as well. Uh, also, Midas has within itself a built-in repository of uh, all the major earthquakes that happened uh, since 1940. So you can directly choose an earthquake uh, response from this uh, very large drop-down drop -down table and uh, you can automatically enter it and you can also manually define a sinusoidal, uh, a sinusoidal response if you want it. For example, for machine vibrations, if you're uh, doing it for, let's say, a plant structure or a factory and you want to analyze for machine vibrations or uh, some things like that, so you can do a sinusoidal uh, function for that. And uh, these are the analysis types that we can get. So hysteretic graph I have already shown you. You can get uh, easily text outputs for uh, displacement velocity and acceleration. And uh, time history graphs at uh, different nodes can also be found. Also, Midas Civil uh, has support for vibration analysis due to walking loads. So recently, particularly after the Millennium Bridge uh, in UK, the uh, pedestrian dynamic loading has, has, has been given a lot of attention since the Millennium Bridge uh, suffered uh, extreme, suffered very drastically from uh, the pedestrian dynamic loadings. So since then, uh, even Midas Civil has ca caught up with the demand and has included the pedestrian dynamic load. So we have the dynamic tra uh, load generator which can generate uh, loadings for uh, both the pedestrian loadings as well as it can generate train loads. So if you want to perform uh, rail structure interaction or dynamic rail structure interaction, so in that case uh, train loads uh, can be automatically generated. Finally, uh, we have what is called mul uh, an option for multiple support excitation. Now, in case of very, very long bridges like uh, let's say the Suthong Bridge or uh, the Sunda or the Cable State Bridges that are uh, very very long. They can be beyond two two three kilometers in span length. The arrival time of the earthquake can be different at different pier locations. For example, in this slide itself, you can see at uh, first look first pier the arrival time is 1.56 seconds. At the second pier, it is 3.48 seconds. So this lag in arrival time means there will be a different structural response as compared to when the arrival time was the same for all the nodes. So Midas Civil has this facility to account for this phenomenon as well. So let me show you uh, this particular uh, feature in Midas Civil. Okay, so here is a model, here is a very simple ladder deck bridge model that uh, I have created and here we have in the works tree you can see some general link properties. So these general links are uh, lead rubber bearing isolators. So you can see from here the, they are uh, lead rubber bearing isolators and uh, the nonlinear properties have been defined uh, like so. So these properties are generally available from the manufacturer info manufacturers. So they usually provide documents uh, detailing the nonlinear and the linear uh, material properties of their isolators. So now that this isolators have been have been uh, created, I have uh, also applied the general link property. So here let me show you, let me zoom in. So here I hope uh, that you will be able to see this uh, very small general link that is uh, representative of the LRB isolator. And this is an already uh, analyzed model. So here I have created uh, time history load cases and uh, this is the response, uh, the, the earthquake loading that is being applied to the structure. 
so a ground acceleration has been applied and uh, a time varying so the dead load of course has been converted to a time varying static load so that uh, in the load case if you see over here in the load case the dead load has actually been considered the presence of the dead load has been considered for uh, the time history analysis so the dead load is also playing a part in the response of the structure during the earthquake finally uh, once this is done, let me show you the response of the structure. So here at different points, you can see the response of the structure in different ways, how it is responding. And of course, we also have the facility to animate uh, this particular case. So you can even uh, animate it. So if I go for uh, a basic recording, I will be able to view the animation of the structure. Now, uh, while the animation is being done, let me also show you some of the other functionalities of uh, Midas Civil. So one of the functionalities is we have a condensed spring support with a 6 by 6 coupled matrix for accounting for mass and damping. This is particularly useful uh, when in case of uh, bridge, bridges like for example you can see in this slide for skew type bridges the dynamic response uh, of the structure can be uh, somewhat different and uh, different uh, nodes may have different spring properties. So here you can manually specify the general spring support type and you can manually specify the uh, stiffness matrix of your uh, particular spring and apply it. Finally, we also have the facility of performing soil structure interaction with the kinematic together with the kinematic hinge model. So for example, this uh, very complex model, uh, here we performed uh, soil structure interaction together with the kinematic hinge modeling to get an accurate representation of uh, the structural response. So here you can see that uh, the recording is done and it is uh, so here I can just uh, put it across and uh, get a very smooth video of uh, how the structure is going to behave. Let me also show you some of the uh, so you can normally get uh, all the required results like forces stresses and let me show you the time history graphs so here normally you are interested in some specific graphs so here I've defined some basic graphs for example displacement at pier top so if I create the graph for this so it will create for me a graph based on the a response of the pier top node with time. So as we can see uh, how the response is varying with time. Similarly you can get a response for uh, other things like shear or forces as well. And if you want uh, to get the results within the uh, LRB bearings you can get them get them from the tables for example in the general link so you just go for uh, earthquake so here you get the absolute maximum effects due to the time history loading within the uh, LRB links so the overall purpose of uh, time history analysis is uh, not not uh, essentially to design the structure but rather to observe its response in a realistic earthquake setting so the des the structural design is more or less uh, com more or less completed from the response spectrum and uh, the pushover analysis considerations the time history considerations generally allow generally act as a 
uh, act as a checking measure for uh, observing whether or not the structure is safe. Finally, uh, let me end my presentation by discussing with you a few project applications of Midas Civil where the dynamic analysis capabilities of the software were used. So first of all, let me show you, it is the La Hablina Bridge in Durango, Mexico. So here, uh, eigenvalue analysis uh, and response spectrum analysis was used together with the construction stage analysis with time dependent effects and uh, vehicle load optimization as well. The Basara Viaduct in Romania, which is one of the uh, longest bridges uh, in Romania currently with an overall bridge length of 1.4 kilometers. Here, uh, nonlinear dynamic uh, time history analysis with the LRB isolators was used and also with viscous dampers. The Stone Cutters Bridge, which is the third longest cable state bridge in the world right now with an overall main span length of 1600 uh, meters. So, eigenvalue analysis, buckling analysis, uh, time dependent effects, so basically a whole bevy of analyses uh, types was used for uh, this particular bridge. Similarly, Sutong Bridge, which is the second longest cable state bridge in uh, crossing the Yangtze River in China. And uh, here also, eigenvalue analysis, uh, thermal buckling, and uh, basically the whole gamut of uh, analysis capabilities offered uh, by Midas was used for this particular bridge. So with that, uh, I'd like to end today's web session. Once again, uh, a very heartfelt thanks from uh, Midas IT for all our attendees who have uh, taken the time to, see, uh, to sit through this web session and to uh, hear me. If uh, you have any queries or if you have any questions at this point, I would be more than happy to answer.